Thank you. Thanks for inviting me to be here, and it's, uh, it's great to be with uh, this group of folks, uh, many of whom have been in the fight for, uh, for 20 years. Uh, you know, I still remember, um, you know, walking from, I guess, the Hudson up to the remains of the World Trade Center, and, uh, you know, 13 and a half years ago. And if I would have thought that 13 and a half years later, we would be having this kind of a discussion and this kind of debate, uh, you know, you almost want to stand up and scream that we've made so little progress uh, in identifying, confronting, containing, and defeating the enemy after the price that we paid on that day and the prices, and the price that we've paid in Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and other activities around the world that we have to have a discussion like this to try to get America back on the right track and uh, identifying who the enemy is and how we're actually going to defeat the enemy and preserve America. Uh, but that's where we are today. And let me just, you know, I put it in context. And I've watched some of this on, uh, you know, on the internet during the day and Frank, you put together a great conference uh, and great speakers. But let me first put it in a context. It would be one thing if we were only dealing with the threat of jihad, but we're not. Uh, we're dealing with the threat of a resurgent Russia. And it's not only Ukraine, but Putin is in Egypt yesterday uh, because we're driving Egypt away from the United States. Uh, we're dealing with a resurgent China that is aggressively, is aggressive military, militarily in, in Southeast Asia. They are economically very, very active in China and they are moving into the Middle East. <coughs> and we're cozying up to Iran, which means that what, with whatever friends we have or had left in the Middle East, we're pushing them away. And then we have this problem of jihad. And so we're not only talking about, you know, how do we develop a strategy to confront jihad, but we're also talking about how do we confront a strategy, or how do we develop a strategy for current confronting jihad and move it to a priority in all of the issues that we are facing internationally. I mean, it is a disaster right now where the U.S. has dropped to in terms of international leadership, specifically regarding what is happening fighting jihad. You know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if Newt said it here this morning. I only saw part of it, but I saw, uh, I think, his speech that he gave uh, in Iowa, and he said, "Let's be honest. We are losing." You know, the, there are those that think that this is a battle of accommodation with jihad and radical jihadists. It, no, this is very much about. For them, it's not about accommodation. It's destroying the West, and we need to realize that for us, it's about very much our survival. You take a look at what's happening around the world, and we are losing. Just take a look, and you know, it'd be nice to have a map up here and say, okay, when we were talking about this threat initially, we said, you know, jihad thrives in places that are, that are ungoverned. And we talked about this remote region in Pakistan and Afghanistan, the border region, and said, you know, that's where Al Qaeda can plan, prepare. Uh, and trained to attack the West. It was some place that most of Ameri most Americans couldn't find on a map. And what we've heard from the speakers today and, and the discussions is that ungoverned areas now are much closer to Europe. And take a look at the listing of the countries. Syria is now an ungoverned area. Not just the area that, you know, where ISIS is in control, but, you know, when a nation state loses control of a significant por portion of its land, really it has become a failed state. The same is true of Iraq. This morning they announced that, what, we're pulling out of Yemen. Yemen was always a problematic area to begin with, but that is now basically an ungoverned area. Libya is an ungoverned area. Nigeria, moving in that direction, any country that needs to delay an election by weeks or months because they don't have control of the geography is, is approaching a 
something that we would call a failed state. These are all now areas where jihadists can plan, prepare, and train to attack the West. Tripoli is an hour from Rome, it's two hours from Paris. That's the kind of environment that we are in. And when you have, and you, and you have that picture of the Middle East, recognize that it creates an environment that now challenges countries that would like to be our allies. Egypt would like to work with the United States. King Abdullah and Jordan, but it threatens those nation states as well because it is chaos in the region around them and gives the jihadists an opportunity to launch ta attacks against those nation states as well. It's a dangerous world. You know, you laid out, you know, you, you've written, the, the, the B team has written a strategy for confronting jihad. Newt has talked about how we identify this politically and identify the threat. Uh, the good news is, you know, that there are there are folks out there that are willing to fight with us. The Kurds, a thousand killed in action. Libya, the government that's been booted out of Tripoli, the people fighting with them, they have lost a thousand killed in action. Both of these are either a region or a country that have about five to seven million people. And think about that, if you extrapolate that proportionally, that would be equivalent to over 60,000 Americans killed in action in a period of 24 to 36 months. These folks are willing, they're the boots on the ground. They are the front lines. They are sacrificing. We shouldn't forget them. But we are. Because what do the Kurds, the Libyans, and the Jordanians have in common? Other than being on the front lines. They are all standing in line waiting for America to provide them with the weapons, the ammunitions, uh, and the equipment to confront ISIL. You know, I was talking to a, someone who had just recently been on the front line with the Kurds, and he says there's four soldiers, they've got 120 bullets, ISIS is 100 yards away. There's plenty of equipment in Baghdad. But Baghdad won't ship it to the Kurds. In certain cases, there's rumors they're actually making the Kurds buy it from them, even though it's designated for them. So we have the allies. That's, it's a pretty, overall, it's a pretty bleak position. I tend to agree with Newt that to believe that over the next 22 months we're actually going to change this president's view of the threat, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, I think that the tools that Congress has are very, very limited to make a president do something in the area of national security that the president doesn't want to do. They can give him the authority to do it. You know, this AUMF uh, discussion is going to be an interesting discussion. They can give the president a tremendous number of tools to confront ISIS, or ISIL. But if he doesn't want to do it, he won't use them. They can't make him do what he doesn't want to do. And the last thing that I would want to do is force a commander in chief to go into a battle that he doesn't believe and commit our troops. That's not fair to our troops and those types of things. So what, what I hope, you know, all the work that so many around, people around this table have done for the last number of years, you know, the challenge now is make sure that today is not an event as good as it was but it, that it actually becomes a catalyzing event for more action over the next 23 months so that when we actually get to November of 2016, we can elect the leadership in the House, the Senate, uh, and in the White House that will actually respond aggressively and implement the kinds of strategies and tactics that so many of you uh, have identified today. And this is, this is a requirement that says, you know, and this is why I'm glad to see Newt engaged the way that he is. Newt is a great communicator. He has the gravitas and 
hopefully to, you know, maybe he can be, uh, bring us together because, you know, I now work with Steve Emerson. And we saw what happened to someone who, an organization, the leader of an organization who's been on the front lines for 20 years. And we see what happens to someone in, in our fellowship who makes a mistake because they're out there waiting. And they, they literally try to destroy Steve. And they can do that to any one of us if we don't stand united. But with the folks that we have around the table and other people who have been, who have been part of this, this fight for 20 years, if we come together and are coordinated, you know, it's, it provides us with the opportunity to shape the future. That's the old, old question you know, everybody's got to ask. If, if we're not going to do it now and we're not going to do it over the next 22 months, uh, who will do it? Uh, and if we don't do it, what will be left? So Frank, thank you for, uh, thank you for hosting this event. Thank you.